Hey, good morning, everyone. Come on in. Students, make your way into chapel and take a seat. We want to get started. We are in the halfway or reaching the halfway point of the semester, making our way to spring break. And so excited about that. Um, we are also in the season of Lent as we talk about the church calendar. And so last week on Wednesday, we had a beautiful uh, Ash Wednesday service uh, th during our praise and worship time. Uh, we directed you to a great resource that we will have during the Lenten season, which is uh, there's, uh, there's posters around, and there's also this, uh, which have this QR code. It's also here on the screen. But this has many, many opportunities and resources for you to look at. So uh, whether it's art, um, it's um, just different ways to engage. There's also a Spotify, pray, uh, um, Spotify playlist as well for you to engage in. Just all of these different ways of understanding what the Lenten season in and what it's inviting us into. The things that we need to let go and also we need to take on. And so I invite you to look into this resource. It'll be a great thing for you. Um, this morning we also have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Rob McKenna. He is our speaker today. You'll be hearing more about him uh, as he is introed. Um, but today after chapel, at 12 o'clock in Cunningham AMB. We'll have some moments, if you guys wanna grab your lunch and wanna talk to him a little bit more and pick his brain about faith and vocation, we'd invite you from 12 to one to come into Cunningham AMB. So just make your way into, grab your lunch and go right through those double doors and we can connect uh, you with Dr. McKenna to speak about uh, faith and vocation. I'm gonna ask uh, Annika if she can make her way forward. And let's go ahead and uh, bow our heads and quiet our hearts as we get ready to worship this morning. And uh, let's, let's pray as we invite, um, open our hearts to God's spirit to work in us. Let's pray. If you'd bow your heads with me. God, the creator of the skies above us and the creator of our hearts, we thank you that you're consistent through the ages, but also consistent in every minute of our lives. As we're reminded of our frailty and humanity during Lent, let us remember our roots in the love you have for us regardless of anything. Would you move through what is planned this morning to help us see ourselves and another and clearer in the light of your grace and love. We welcome you in this place and we come before you humbly and expectantly to see you through service this morning. It is in you and through you we live and move and have our being. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. As we continue to just make our way into chapel, I know a lot of us are holding different weights as we come into this place. And so I just want to remind us that this is an opportunity to be present, to pause in the middle of our day. And I know midterms are this week, and we got a lot of thoughts running through our minds. But as we stand together this morning, would we just offer those up to God? And would we allow God to reveal himself to us this morning in a new way? I love this language in Ephesians 2, where Paul is praying that God would be made known to us and that our hearts would be flooded with light. So this morning, would your hearts be flooded with light as God reveals himself in a new way? Let's sing this together. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes and let me see the beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Lift your voice this morning.
We're going to sing a hymn next, and I just want us to pay close attention to the words. They might be a little bit unfamiliar, um, but they talk about surrender. And these aren't always easy words to sing of surrender, of giving our full lives over to God, um, but they are a reminder that God desires every piece of us, every piece of our hearts and our minds and our bodies, and to be given over into worship to our Father. And so I just wanna invite us into this posture of surrender, and it's this simple act of just opening up your hands out to God. Wherever you're at in this place, whatever is burdening your mind and your heart or your body, would you just lift it over to God? Praying that, God, I don't have much to give, but what I do have, I trust you with it. So in this place, God, by your grace, we trust you with whatever we have. Whatever we have to offer you this morning, we trust you with it. And we sing out together. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Oh, here's 
you keep this open posture for the reading of the scripture as Dory comes up. Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 10. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was laying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of the God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and he lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lay down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling to the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lay down, and if he calls, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. The word of the Lord. Uh, Good morning, Loma. My name is Ryan McKenna, and I have the pleasure of introducing you all to today's chapel speaker. Uh, Named among the top 30 most influential industrial organizational psychologists, a multiple-time TEDx speaker and featured in Forbes and Psychology Today, uh, Dr. Ron McKenna is the founder and CEO of Wild Leaders and the creator of the whole Intentional Leadership Development Toolkit, aka the Wild Toolkit. He spent over two decades as a university professor and has now fully committed his life to developing this generation of courageous and sacrificial leaders. That's us. Whether it's corporations, small businesses, universities, uh, tech firms, or ministries around the world, his call to develop leaders has taken him to every industry, guild, and leadership context you can imagine. I'm telling you, he's thrilled to be here. Above all that, though, most importantly to me, he's my dad. And on a personal note, um, he's one of the few dads who will text his sons on a random weeknight asking us to play Call of Duty. (laughs) Yes, that would happen much more than you would think. Please extend a warm welcome to Dr. Rob McKenna, AKA Bad Bobby. Wow, 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 wow. Good morning, Point Loma. Come on, this is, this is amazing. I can't believe it. Last time I was in this room was at New Student Orientation, so I was a weeping mess and right about back there. So um, some of you know what that's like. So Dory, thank you for reading scripture. Um, I want us to, probably me, hold on. Uh, go back. I'm, I kind of have a thick skull around scripture, so I want to read this again um, and listen to this story from 1 Samuel. It says this. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Which sounds a little familiar. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out yet. And Samuel, 
who by the way was about 12 years old, we think, was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. By the way, this is a weird thing. I just thought about this. Like he's sleeping, he's lying down where the ark was. I'm just picturing a kid doing that. It's just, I, it's interesting. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I didn't call. Go back and lie down. So he went and he lay down. Again, the Lord called. And Samuel got up, and, he, and the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up, and at that point then, hold on one second, folks. This is the problem with iPads. Okay, give me one second. He said, Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. And he went back to Eli, and Eli said, I didn't call, go back and lie down. And now Samuel did not know the, yet know the Lord. This is what's fascinating. I have had more students over the years ask me, if I don't know the Lord, do you believe that I am called? It's fascinating, because I read this story and I say, well, Samuel didn't. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. And then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say this, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. What I love about this story is that it's very messy. And it feels a lot like my relationship to the Lord sometimes. God calling Samuel feels similar to the way God's voice often sounds in my own life. And it took, and this is what's interesting, if you hear this, it took Eli to help him work it out. And even Eli, wise Eli, didn't know what was going on until the fourth time. And I don't know about you, but I can relate to this. It's a messy process of misunderstanding and working through the night before he actually got it. But here's what's interesting also, is that God had an important job for Samuel. Samuel, the story of Samuel is an amazing, if you don't know it, but to go to read, but Samuel ended up anointing Saul and David, the first kings of Israel. And so I have a question for you, everybody, from the front row to the back. Why are you here, and what is God saying to you lately? If you have a notepad, <laughs> write it down. Why are you here, and what is God saying to you lately? There's three things as I, just in this beginning here, I wanna mention. First, I am eternally grateful to this community. I will never forget when we first pulled up to Claussen dorm, uh, the dorm, in the fall of 2021, when we were going to move Ryan in, and he knew none of you people, none of you. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And there were 50 or 60 of you, some of you probably graduated now, greeting us, and I'm not kidding, I almost drove our rental car over the hill down into the dorm because I started to cry like openly. And Ryan grabbed me from the back seat and he grabbed my arm and he goes, Dad, pull it together. It was, a, it was a very awkward moment. And someday your kids will go off to college and you'll understand how important that moment was to me for Ryan. So Ryan, I'll pull it together just for you. The second thing is this. I follow Loma Sleeps. <laughs> so I have one goal, that there is absolutely nothing that can be posted today that no pictures will be taken of students sleeping in chapel today. It's a lofty goal, but I'm gonna roll with this goal. And I'm telling you, I was a back row sitter in chapel, and those of you in the back row, I'm talking to you as much if not more than the people even in the front. I mean that. I wish someone maybe had told me that. And the third thing is this. There is a tagline that I see whenever I'm on anything regarding Point Loma Nazarene University, and it is this. Listen to this line. This is not empty words. This is not just a tagline. Who are you called to be? Who are you called to be? If nothing else, I hope you see how profound, unique, and absolutely practical that question is for you today. 
And that, that's, that statue in the middle of campus, I know you've seen it before, of the moment that Jesus calls Peter to a transcendent summons beyond him, I hope you never look at that statue the same way again. Because the first time I saw it, I knew something special was here. So I ask you this simple question, but for some of you, a troubling question. Why are you here, and what is God saying to you lately? And what in the world does that have to do with your studies here at Point Loma, your career, and the rest of your life? So just a little bit of background. Um, I, as Ryan mentioned, I've given my life to the development of a generation of courageous and sacrificial leaders. It's a reference to Philippians 2. I think it's a hard job, but I think many of us in the room are up to this challenge. And throughout my 30s and into my 40s as well, I was a part of multiple longitudinal studies of populations of leaders. And so we followed, when I say longitudinal, those of you who are psychology majors will know what I'm talking about. We, we followed groups of leaders for multiple years, studying their developmental journey, applying the best psychology we could to understand what was going on in each of their lives. And what I will tell you that I learned is this, that is just common to every one of your experiences as I'm looking you in the eye. Your developmental journey, your vocational journey is complex. It's not as simple as an airport book that says, here's the three things to know about life. Because psychologically speaking, there will be multiple variables going on in every one of your stories that are already happening. You already know it. Do your motivations matter? Absolutely. Motivation is a huge factor in your life. Do goals matter? Absolutely. Does whether or not you are surrounded by people who give you hard feedback and people who have your back and people whose shoulders you could cry on if your world were falling apart, does that matter? I'm telling you, psychologically speaking, it is one of the most profound variables in a person's life. Your capacity to develop other people around you also will play a critical role. And your doubts and your brokenness they matter too. I can tell you this, I work with CEOs all, in all kinds of contexts. There's, if there's one truth that I see every single time, it is that brokenness is always there. Do you hear me? Like, I'm, I'm trying to see you all. The stories of, like, of fragmentation that you feel, they're always there. And they're walking right alongside your moments of redemption. So these parts of you that feel fragmented and are somewhat off track, it's normal. And you know what else is fascinating is that the story and the journey of leaders, when you look at the psychology, you know what it reads like? It reads like the Gospels. That psychology and faith are not far apart. In fact, if anything, psychological research just affirms the Gospel story. And so I know that you're, all the variables that are functioning in your lives, and I'm telling you that those things are going to matter. They're going to matter for you today, and they're going to matter for you tomorrow as well. But I've got to tell you one other thing, one other piece of this puzzle. So I was doing that study. I am also, as Ryan kind of let out of the box, I am a gamer. I don't play this game. I play Call of Duty. But I, uh, I never played, for, well, I, I shouldn't say this, I did play Fortnite. I was really bad at it because I'm not a multitasker, so I don't get the building thing and the defending yourself part. So um, I don't like that part of the game. But when that game was, was, I don't know if it's still popular, or some of you might play, but I was with uh, my sons Aiden and Ryan and they were in the back seat of the, my truck and we're driving along. And one of them said to me, they said, hey, Rod, hey dad, the meta in Fortnite just changed. And I kind of knew the answer to this already, but I wanted to ask, I go, oh, oh fellas, what's the meta? And they go, well, it's the fundamental rules of the universe or of the game. And if you're a game developer, you know that the fundamental rules in a game and the things that you code impact the way people play. Are you with me? I need a yes. I need some verbal affirmation, okay? It matters. There's a meta going on. If you nerf a certain weapon in Fortnite, it changes everything. It changes it. Do we still use that word nerf? I'm trying to sound relevant right now. I don't know if that's still common, okay? It matters. Game developers know that. They change one rule, one line of code, and it changes the way you behave. And I want to suggest to you that when it comes to the meta regarding calling and purpose, we are playing by different rules than what the developer intended. We are playing by different rules. And I want to give you an example of this and why the statements at Point Loma matter so deeply to me. 
There is a saying in our culture that we use often with college students. And the saying is this, or the question is this, what is your calling? Has anyone ever asked you what is your calling? Or you've asked yourself, what is my calling? And I used, a, I used to assign a book called Callings that I actually heard about here on the Point Loma campus at a conference years ago by a guy named Placker. And this book walks you through just a couple of millennia of people's thinking and theologians and pastors on how they approach calling. And I'll tell you this, that we live in a generation, when, it, when I look back at those, those earlier iterations on faith and call and what my work has to do with it, there's no evidence in those past millennia that that phrase was used hardly ever. When people thought of calling, it, there, were, there were other problems in different generations, believe me. There were times when people believed that the only people who were called, like in medieval times, were people who were monks or priests. But in our generation, and at the beginning of this, this book, they would go through these different sections, in these hundreds of years sections, they would describe what these different authors were describing. And, and so you kind of get this, this intro. If you don't want to read all the original stuff, you don't want to read Joan of Arc, you can actually read the intro section. And I thought for a while, what would our section of this book, when it's written, be called? The introduction to the great thinkers of our time. And I think it would be called this. It was all about us. It was all about us. And I think there's something important to pay attention to in that meta that we are living in. And so as we, I, wanna, I wanna break down for you just a couple of things. And, and when I talked about the different variables going on in a person's life, and I do work with leaders, and by the way, I have a big investment in that because every major movement of change in our world, we often talk about the need for, for clean water, we talk about fighting human trafficking, we talk about the necessity for missions around the globe. Do you know what every one of those things starts with? A leader. It will start with you. And we talk a lot about the needs of those different populations of people, but we don't often talk about what it means to develop leader capacity, to do the job. And one of the most important things for leaders, and this is not just supported because it's in scripture, it's also there's research to support this. Calling and purpose is one of the most important topics you can be thinking about today. And so I wanna break these two words down, calling and purpose, because most of us kinda mix these things up sometimes. And I wanna start with purpose. So I brought a toolbox. And in this toolbox, you got lots of different tools. You've got a level. Who doesn't need a level, right? Um, you got a tape measure, 25-foot tape measure to be specific. There's also in here a stud finder. And if Bobby B were here, this thing would be going off like crazy right now, but he's not here, so we can't talk about it. Um, but in this toolbox, there's a hammer. I want you to think about purpose for just a moment. What is the purpose of this hammer? It has two, right? Somebody yell it out, what are the two purposes? Hammer nails and what else? Pull nails, right? You look at it, you know what it's designed for. This hammer was created for two purposes. Pounded pull nails. When I think about purpose, I think about Amazon products. When you go on, you buy a product, what are you looking for? What, how big is it? Will it fit where I want it to go? How have other people used it? What are its uses? What is its purpose? Does it fit with the purpose that I need it to do? And what I wanna suggest to you is this. Your discovery of your unique design is really important. Things like your personality, and by the way, personality only predicts about 30 to 40% of every other variable in your life, so don't over pivot to personality. But personality matters. You understanding your unique skills matter. You understanding the things you're designed for, the things that excite you. You understanding the unique way that you contribute to team projects and classes. You understanding the depth of knowledge and skill in your major is absolutely critical. Do you hear me? All the professors, are there any professors here? Like, amen, maybe? It matters. It matters. It will matter for the rest of your career. So getting that expertise and studying deeply in your major matters. You understanding your purpose, the purpose for which you're here, but it's not the main point. This word calling is interesting. I already mentioned to you that we use a description of this where we say, we tell students, and I couldn't believe it. I told, 
Dr. Brower, I said, I, a lot of college campuses don't do this. You use a language that's different here. You talk about who you're called to be. Because calling is this. Even psychologists agree, even secular psychologists agree, calling is a transcendent summons on your life. Do you hear me? Which in my theology is God. It's a summons on your life. Because the question is this. This purpose, let's assume it had a brain for a second. Which one needed in the scarecrow that needed a brain? I think so. If it had a brain, there's another part of purpose that's interesting, and it's determination. Because as a human being, part of your purpose is what you want. And so here's what's kind of fascinating. This hammer, we know this, was designed for two things. Could the hammer be called to do something other than pound and pull nails? Of course, right? Like there's nothing I have not pried open with a hammer. I've used a hammer as a paperweight when I was giving a speech in, on a windy day. And if the hammer had a brain, what it might say is, I don't do that. I pound and pull nails, Rob, I don't do that. Well, I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I need you to do this other thing. Calling may or may not be aligned with what you currently understand your purpose to be. That calling is God's desire for you. It's what God might be saying to you or asking for you of you in this moment. And I ask this weird question because I am so tired of pat answers in the box when you ask people what their calling is. What I'm really interested in, and this is why I'm really uncomfortable at parties to be around, you don't want, you want to run away from, maybe don't come to lunch today. Um, what I'm interested in is, what is God saying to you lately? What is God saying to you lately? And it's, what's interesting to me about that is that, what about this possibility that God is saying nothing right now? Why wouldn't that be okay? Why wouldn't God be sitting in silence with you? You know what I'm talking about? You have, do you have any friends where the most intimate, like deepest moments are where you do nothing and you say nothing? Those are your real friends, right? And so I think one of the things that frustrates me sometimes, and I'm, now I'm just putting myself in college again, is that so often people told me, like, to understand your calling, Rob, is pray and read your Bible, to which I would say those are great things. But what no, no one ever said to me was thinking about how I actually hear God. And fundamentally, what's interesting about this word calling, when we say, what is your calling? If I say to my son and all of his friends, what, I'm asking that question, what is your calling? What we have done with a generation is we have turned what is a summons on their life into an identity. We've turned what's more like a verb into a noun. We've turned it from something that you hear to something that you have. And for me, I just wish someone had said that much sooner and said, Rob, your only job is to listen. And my listening, you all, is messy. That's why I relate to this story about Samuel. It's like, my prayers with God, you would think I'm a crazy person most days, because I just, I, I, when I talk to God, I'm like, I don't know, I don't know if I'm saying the right things, Lord, is this right? And I'm, you know, kind of working through it, and I'm saying like, I don't know if I should ask for anything, it's okay if I ask for some things, and I don't know if I should, do I, do, do I thank you for my house? That feels weird, but because I know that most people don't have a house. So it's just like, I have these kinds of conversations, and I listen to Samuel's story, and I go, oh my gosh. This morning, I woke up, and I'm rereading this scripture, and I'm sitting in my hotel room, and I just got on my knees, and I said, I don't know any other way. I just said, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And even some of you who like, like, whose faith is far from God, you feel distant from that. You're trying to make sense out of what's going on in worship this morning. My hope is that you read that story of Samuel and you go like, Samuel was not near the Lord. But God was asking him to do something. That was just the beginning of his story. I have, I have pastor friends who have struggled. I have one of my friends who would say, I, didn't, I never heard God's voice more clearly than I was called to full-time pastoral ministry. And he left seminary, became a full-time pastor, and he hated the job. And that's all he knew to be. And if you hate your job, and you are your calling, do you hear where I'm going? What are you left to feel 
The possibility of even like self-loathing, of kind of being like, well, who am I? And all I want to suggest to you is that the, I think the part of the job in terms of calling is simply to listen. And, and listen in your weird way. I kind of hate it when people go and they ask them like, where do you get closest to God? And they say, in nature. I kind of get bugged when I go on a hike. You know why I'm bugged? Is because we think that nature is some magical thing where God lives. Do you know why nature works? <laughs> I, feel, I know I'm sounding kind of earnest. Some of you are like, I'm scared of him right now. Do you know why nature works? Because it stops us. Like, we don't listen very well. And so I think when it comes to this, I hope that, you, I hope that makes sense to you. I hope for some of you you're like, oh my gosh, it could be that simple. Because that's why I want to ask you, what is God saying to you lately? And if you say I'm not sure, I am way more intrigued than a pastor who gives me some line I've heard a thousand times. Do you know what I'm saying? I want to know that. Because Samuel's story says it's going to be messy. And here's the thing. Calling and purpose are related. I don't want to minimize the, what I said before. You understanding what kind of hammer you are is really critical. And the relationship between calling and purpose that is kind of interesting to me. You know what they have in common? An issue of will. What it is you want and what it is that God wants. Can I hear that louder? What it is, and here's the deal. In so much, in so many parts of the church, we have made it illegal to desire something. What you want matters. And if you're, if you're a leader someday and you're leading me, you know what will make me trust you? If you get up, on your, get up every morning and you're on your knees saying, Lord, speak to me. Your servant is listening. You can do what you want with my life. You know what I want to know next? Now I want to know what you want. I want to know the desires of your heart because you were created with efficacy and agency and the ability to choose. And so both things will matter. But here's what will happen in your world. Without attention to this, for many of you, career, I see this happening over and over again, because I, I, I pushed in the last several years 450 students out into major corporations, and I told them before they left the hands of the faculty, I said, these corporations you're going to work for are powerful things in defining the meta of your life. Money is a powerful thing. Resourcing is a powerful thing. And if there's one thing that I will be praying for for each of you is that you will remember that vehicle, your job, what you study, it matters but it's not the main point. The main point will be what is it that God is summoning you to do? And just listen in your own weird way. That's what I would beg you to just put aside all your other things and say just find silence. As you read scripture, read scripture in your weird way. I have my own weird ways that I do that. But the way that you do it, because you were created, God is looking at you like Samuel and he sees you by name, and he knows that you function in a way that is unique to you. So I have a couple of, here's a couple of tips. Number one, if you wanna know, like, how do I listen, Rob? How do I listen? We've made calling so hard. This one, get to know the caller, and let the caller get to know you. This was mentioned in worship this morning. When the Apostle Paul talks about being unveiled it means that our raw selves being unveiled is when the glory of God is actually most manifest. So be yourself. Let the caller get to know you, the real you. Stop and listen. Mountaintops aren't magic, but they do make us stop. Find your rhythm for listening, a time and a place. Listen together. If you, don't, if you have friends, you know, listen together. It was Eli and Samuel that, that heard the Lord. And then finally, I would just say this. It's as simple as this. Get on your knees, however you do it. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Let me pray. God, thank you for, oh man, thank you for this community. Thank you for Point Loma Nazarene University. A tremendous vehicle in our lives. And God, I just pray that every person here, um, as they go into their classes, will know this is important stuff that they're learning, but it's not the main point. Lord, help us to listen. Help us to pray that prayer. You guys have a great day. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. <laughs>